Hi, and welcome back to Chapter 5 of Travels with My Lamps. The first tour. Uh, this was the first time I left home, went thousands of miles away, and had to rely on myself, for better or for worse. My first real tour was with a band called High Rise, a top 40 band that came and went. They were a four-piece band, and I was contracted as a sound lighting operator, pseudo road manager, and driver. We were to be out for at least three to four months with a break at Christmas, and then out to the Maritimes. The first thing I noticed that I was making 500 bucks a week, and each band member was making $75 a week. We left from Toronto and hit the road. We gigged our way around Ontario, and it started my lifelong lifetime of travels on Highway 17, or the longest street in the world. We played in Smooth Rock Falls for Halloween, where the best costume was a guy dressed like a skidoo. And what he had was a cardboard box from a fridge, a couple of skis on the front, and a seat. And people made fun of him when he came in, because, you know, he was taking up a lot of room, but he ended up giving all the girls skidoo rides around the bar. Skidoo for the win. So uh, after a 10 hour drive, after that, we were in Hull, Quebec, to play at the Papillon, a biker bar. We waited for hours until somebody showed up to let us in. The night before it was Halloween, on a Saturday, an anvil had played, and the stage and club was filled with raw cuts of meat. They were throwing meat at each other. It's a tough biker bar, and we were playing the front end, usually a pretty crappy couple of nights, but our goal was to be working a minimum of six nights a week on the road, so the only thing that saved us from certain death was a couple of ZZ Top numbers that we put into each set. Now from there we gigged all our way down to New Brunswick. We we're playing more bars and in Rishibuktu, New Brunswick we were staying on a native reserve and playing in the only bar in town. Now the chief showed up as we were getting ready for our first show to welcome us to the hood and he and his wife knocked on the door and they opened up and they had an entire tray of salmon steaks and a pot of boiled potatoes and a dozen OV. He was also the bootlegger, so if he needed something, it was a phone call away and the band took him up on it. So one really raucous evening, a little bit of damage got caused. The band got in a big old fight because that's what they like to do and a door got broken. Now I was all for owning up to the damage. So I figured giving the chief a couple of bucks in cash and a humble apology would get us out of real trouble, but the band decided no. They're just going to get out of town. Those are brand new cabins. And we were one of the first bands to stay there. So uh, I was ready. Before cell phones, so we traveled to the next town, Edmonston. Well, the landlines must have been burning up because by the time we got to that bar, they didn't want to hire us. They thought that we were a bunch of, you know, hooligans. Maybe they were right. I knew the agent, Jerry Cameron. And I phoned him up and I said, Jerry, it's me, I'm out with the band. Listen, um, yeah, they made a couple mistakes, but you, you make some calls for us. I'll personally take responsibility for the band and nothing bad's going to happen. And we did. And they made us stay in a one-bedroom apartment in the middle of winter. Uh, but we got the gig. And that's all that really mattered. So at this point, I made the boys go back to Rishibuktu and deal with it. But the chief had gone to the cops. And they had to go to the station and officially get arrested for the vandalism. Now, months later, after we got home, they had to take the train all the way back down there to go to court. Better just to be honest up front, isn't it? So, uh, we're on our way. We've got all the way out east. And, of course, the tour ends in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. And we got to get back. So, we start driving. Me and the bass player taking shifts. And we drive, we go, okay, we're going to go this far, and we get to that place, and I'd be like, well, if, well, let's keep going. By the time we got to Montreal, we just came home. Straight shot, Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, all the way to the ferry, all the way through the Maritimes, Quebec, and home. Because, you know, at that point, we hated each other. And uh, High Rise, well, they were toppled by the roads and the parties and stuff like that, but I was just getting started. Chapter 5. Travels with my lamps. Peace out.
Hello, my name is Eric, and I like to do draw rings. So here's what the first tour's rig looked like. On each side of the stage, had two AOI base pins, something like that. And then we had this big old Martin kind of mid, not a fill of shave, but something different with a cone in it. And then your favorite JBL biradials on top and a set of potato mashers. So that was a PA on each side. So of course, you know, you'd have to have stereo, right? So that's what we traveled with for Maine's PA on the first trip. Probably had a couple of monitors out front like that, right? So on the So a backlight truss, probably oh, 32 feet long, something like that. Definitely made out of TV tower. Something like that. And on a couple of tripod Manfrotto light stands, which were rated for, I don't know, I think 125 pounds. And I'm going to say we had 400 on each one. So on that truss, anybody could just hang your lights down low like that or up top. No, no, no. I had to outhang them like that. Just, you know, to make the truss super sketchy and uneven in weight, but it looked the bomb. So there would have been four racks of six, four racks of four 1Ks up there, because there was Soka that was six way and you had two extra circuits. So out of those extra circuits, there would have definitely been a rack of 250 watt ACLs up top. And probably a couple of Altman Lecos with gobos coming down and hitting the cigar. Uh, there would have been some cop lights on the stage. And there would have been another Leco under here, because I think I was traveling with four at the time. Probably a rack of vertical ACLs on the outside of each one going down. And then of course, naturally, you gotta have your homemade smoke pots. So they would have been probably one on either side of the drum riser to go boom and you know, blow all kinds of fuzzy great smoke in the air so you could see your lights. And that was the first rig I took out. And that was a band called High Rise. And now a little overview of our front of house from that tour. So right in the middle of my front of house, I had a tall effects rack that I made myself with a plexi, plexiglass back on it. So in there, there would have been, uh, oh, maybe an SPX90 at best. And then some Yamaha EQs and Ashley, comps, gates, that sort of thing. And I had an oral exciter. Mmm, exciter. So over on this side for audio, 400B. Good old Soundcraft. And then over here, I had a keyboard player A-frame. Excuse the drawing. And on top, LDS consoles. And on the bottom, a tray that held small light boards, switches for pyro, and an ounce of black hash. And all that connected to the stage with analog snakes, digital snakes. And let me tell you, there was a lot of copper between me and them.